Okay. Now, we are, we are talking about the loneliness pandemic. And, and part, of, part of this loneliness uh, pandemic, trying to think through this thing in this, in this last week, I, I, I just recalled experiencing so much love and compassion from the community when Loki was, was born. Uh, visitors came to the hospital and and when we came out of the hospital again people just came family and friends and, 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 and you guys and we just felt so loved and so supported the best thing of it all by a country mile is the fact that you guys brought food lots and lots of food great food thank you so much for that as a matter of fact the, the food was so good and I'm, I'm seriously considering having another child even if it is just for that uh, two or three weeks of, of food that's just poured on you and and like I said it, it was so encouraging to all of us and then I, I, I thought about that when I considered friends of us in Dialuach, Derek and Marnal that many of you know had their baby during the lockdown period and having a baby during during lockdown means that they had no visitors at the hospital. It means that they had uh, no, no friends and family who could come and visit them after, the, after they got out of the hospital and they're in their house, they're starting this new adventure and they cannot really share it with anyone. And what's probably most shocking and most um, depressing from the whole situation is the fact that uh, Marnell's dad, who just lives less than 100 kilometers away, still hasn't seen his grandchild. And I, I mean, celebrating with a loved one and, and, and celebrating maybe the birth of a new kid and trying to share the joy and the burden of that with other people. That's one thing. And, and that's why I really feel sorry for, for Derek and Marnell and thousands of, of other people in this country and abroad uh, who, who are going through this very same thing. But imagine for a moment, it's not joy that you want to share, but grief that you want to share. And, and you, you lose somebody during this lockdown period. And, and this is not a hypothetical situation. Uh, 1,500 people die in South Africa every day. 1,500 people, not of the virus, just for various causes. And, and now they cannot grieve. It's, it's a mockery of a funeral, if you want to call it a funeral. You're not allowed to embrace people that you love uh, to, to, to help you through this, to really try and remember this person in a meaningful way and to, to mourn the death of, of, of loved ones. And, 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 and this, is, this is very problematic and, and, and many people are, are thinking about this. I, I know the, the theologian N.T. Wright, who, whom I love to quote, he says that we must be very careful for the fallout that's going to come out of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic because uh, he, he talks about displaced grief. In other words, people will not know how to deal with, with the grief. They, they weren't able to grieve properly. And chances are that uh, this, this, this pandemic will, will hit them long after the pandemic is gone in terms of uh, of just grieving in isolation. Now, there are various ways in which we as a church and as Christians can respond to this pandemic. And unfortunately, many, many Christians went the route of saying that God is punishing us for something. I, I know some people said that God is punishing us for breaking the Levitical laws in, in Wuhan, and that's where it jumped from animal to, to human. I mean, that, that God only decides to do that now is absurd because they've been doing that in Wuhan and, and everywhere else for a very long time. Uh, and, and, and these are some of the very predictable and silly explanations that people try to give. Other people say it's the end times and apparently 5G has got something to do with it. How that is possible, I don't know. But if you, if you leave, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to say, if you leave Christians and fake news uh, next to each other for long enough, then, then you're going to get strange combinations. But the proper response, a biblical response to all of this is lament, to really pour our hearts out and to, to put this before God. We've got this rich tradition of lament. Just think of Psalm 88 that says the following, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit and I am like one without strength. 
I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends, and you have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call you, Lord, every day I spread out my hands to you, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And that's how the psalm ends. And like I said, I think it's a proper response for us to lament. Lament the fact that family and friends cannot share uh, good times with us, couldn't share Easter with us. We can lament the economic fallout that's going to happen because of this. We can lament the uncertainty that comes because of this time. I, I, I really love how appropriate the psalm is. If you look at uh, verse 8, it says, You have taken from me my closest friends. Check. In, in our current situation and you have made me repulsive to them check no hugs no uh, high fives no handshakes i am confined and cannot escape sounds familiar right and then he just says my eyes are dim with grief you have taken from me friend and neighbor darkness is my closest friend let's let's acknowledge this let's not be sentimental about this the situation sucks we want to share things with other people. We want to work. Some of us are very frustrated about that. We want to exercise. I am very frustrated about that. Uh, we had travel plans. And, and these are, are trivial in comparison to people who are hungry, who are starving. Serious, serious issues uh, that we face in this country and, and globally. And it's important to know that our faith gives us room to lament. Something that I like to tell my atheist friends is that all of this so-called, not all, but most of these, the so-called new atheist objections against God uh, that, that seems so cutting edge, it's in the Bible. It's in scripture. God's people lamenting, using that, those same arguments against God. So there's nothing new. And, uh, and, and even the climax of the Christian story is where Jesus laments his isolation on the cross. And again, we are called to do that. We are invited into that world. But here's the thing. We have to admit that we have been in voluntary isolation for a while now. Well before the lockdown. We have been in voluntary isolation for a while now. What's interesting is that even though it's cheaper than ever before to phone people, we are talking to our family less. And, and this is the, the research is, is quite clear on this. Even though it is cheaper to travel than ever before, we are seeing our family and close ones less. Even though um, it's, it's, it's cheaper, more affordable, more options to connect with other people, we are not necessarily using that to connect deeply with, with family and friends. Robert Putnam is a Harvard political scientist, and he wrote a book, Bowling Alone, a very famous book, talking about the decline of community in, in the United States. And I quite like the title, Bowling Alone. I haven't read the book, but I, I've, I've read a summary of it, and I, I, I like um, the title because th this is what he's getting at. If, if we watch films from the United States, like the Flintstones, the cartoon, the Flintstones, they're always bowling, and they had these bowling leagues. And if, you, if you've seen the movie The Big Lebowski, again, just loads of scenes of... of Lee, uh, bowling leagues etc but Robert Putnam realized that, that bowling leagues have all but disappeared in the United States and people are bowling alone and it's gone way past just bowling alone I think in an appropriate way if we have to write a second edition of Robert Putnam's book it'll be scrolling alone because that's what we're doing we're scrolling alone something that I thought about and I'm pretty sure it's well documented is the fact that in in the past People didn't really consider watching television as a family pastime. But today, I think it would be considered a family pastime if we watch a movie together. But we don't even do that. Remember how, how families, this is going to sound strange, remember way back when families had to fight over the remote control in terms of who gets to watch what, and then you don't want to watch this, the silly romantic uh, comedy that your sister is watching and she doesn't want to watch the action or um, dad wants to watch, watch the sport but mom wants to watch the soapy, forgive all these uh, gender stereotypes. 
and and we fight for the remote control but at least that was a sense of community you know trying to hit each other and and try and run away with the remote control or whatever but now we don't even have that problem we don't even have that community that fight because everybody's just streaming various things on their own devices i i read reports uh, from from britain that says that half of people over 65 in britain and in britain there are millions of people over 65 say it claims that television and their pets um, are their main source of company television and a pet uh, happens to be their main source of, of company in the united uh, kingdom in japan you can pay for people to it's not prostitution but people to hug you and to dine with you so so again don't don't think it's sinister necessarily it's bizarre but it's not sinister uh, you, you can pay for people to just hang out with you that's, that's something that you can do in Japan. As a matter of fact, a recent study said half a million people under the age of 40 in Japan did not leave their houses for six months. They didn't interact with friends or family or anybody uh, for, uh, for, for six months. In the European Union, 34% of, of all households are solo. Just one person living in that, in that house. And I read that South Africa, I think, ranks, ranks eighth in terms of the world's loneliest country. Although... I am very suspicious of that metric. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very suspicious of, of, of what they use to, um, to measure that. Uh, but at least, at least I know that many of the middle class pockets in South Africa experience increase uh, you know, a lot of loneliness. And, and I mean, I've, I've tested this with many of you. To, to, when I ask you, do you know your neighbor? Do you know the guy who lives under you or next to you or above you? And for the most part, we do not, we, we cannot answer those, those questions in the affirmative. So the middle class South Africans definitely experience a lot, of, a lot of loneliness. In Los Angeles, this is very bizarre. In Los Angeles, there's a man who charges a per mile rate to walk with his customers. So in other words, people would come and, and shop there and then they want to continue with the conversation. So he's got people, he's got five assistants who will walk with those people to their stop or to their apartment or whatever and continue a conversation and it's a per mile rate. It's absurd. And in the United Kingdom, uh, I think it's Tracy Crouch, if I'm not mistaken, she is now the Minister for Loneliness. There's literally a portfolio for, for loneliness. Now, I have to admit that, that I am an introvert. I, uh, people, people drain me. And I, uh, you know, when, when, after a social interaction, uh, me and Lorraine are polar opposites in, in terms of this. And, and, and we often fight about this as well because uh, she wants people in her life and, and I need to go and recharge somewhere else. But, but I experience loneliness, especially with the, the touring business. Uh, you know, when, when I would go ahead and, and try and prepare things, then I would go for a couple of days without, without speaking properly to other people. And then when somebody asks me a question, then my voice doesn't come out quite right. It's, it's as if I've lost the ability to speak. And um, I, I also remember when, when I first moved to, to Pretoria, experiencing um, quite a bit of loneliness just moving from Potterstrom to Pretoria and, and, and not knowing people, it was, it was quite a lonely experience. So, so this is something that a lot of people can identify with. And, and loneliness has been a long time coming, especially in the Western world. Uh, René Descartes, the great rationalist philosopher, he, he said that famous thing, cogito ergo sum, in other words, I think, therefore I am. And, and without going into much detail, the, the, the significance of that is, is the fact that knowledge became private. It became based on the individual. Knowledge is not something that we collectively, and it's something that we do on an individual basis. Again, that's a gross oversimplification of that. But in, in 1987, the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, um, famously said that there is no society, only individuals. Now, this is the implication of the thought of Descartes and, and some of these other philosophers and, and later Enlightenment thinking. And uh, so, so all the way from Descartes to Nietzsche to Sartre and, and eventually to Margaret Thatcher, the individual trumps everything. Now, where does this end? Because this is untested in, in terms of, of, of trying this on, on a global scale historically and in many other parts of the world. So where does this end? Now, Neil Howe, he's, he's at Forbes magazine, and, and he writes this. He says, 
So far, much of the alarm surrounding loneliness has been met with efforts by public officials to help all the residents build social connections. But policy interventions are hardly sufficient to stop or even slow the momentum of a social trend which has been gathering steam worldwide for decades. And when we can't easily slow something, we had better brace for the consequences. In this case, the consequences include rising uh, rates of chronic physical and emotional illness triggered by loneliness and social isolation. In this case, the consequences include rising rates of chronic physical and emotional illness triggered by loneliness and social isolation. There's a growing body of scientific work suggesting that loneliness is as damaging as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being obese. And the studies at the moment, it's, it's just flying in of uh, the, the negative effect on, on depression uh, with, in, in response to this, this current corona, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And, and the, the depression rate has quadrupled because people feel isolated and lonely. It is a, it is a big problem that, that is coming. And I think we need to do everything we can with technology to try and fight that now. And it's something that after the, the lockdown that we need to take very seriously in terms of our pastoral work, in terms of our outreach, to really look at people and try and find them. But let me just say this, that loneliness is not necessarily a bad thing. Paul Tillich, the great theologian, he said that there's a difference between lonely, loneliness and solitude. And that's an important distinction to make. Because if you, if you are alone and there's this hint of loneliness, it can call you to a higher reality. So, so let me explain with a passage from Scripture. So, so in, in Genesis, we read Adam felt incomplete because there wasn't another human. And, and we often think that he felt incomplete because there wasn't a wife, there wasn't a spouse for him. But I think we're reading too much into it. It's not just about it, it being a romantic relationship. It is the fact that Adam, as an image bearer of God, needs it, it's essential for him to have other humans in which to live out this God-giving image. And, and the reason for that is because that is the nature of God himself. Uh, God is a trinity. He, he, he's, he's, he's got, there are three persons in the Godhead. In other words, God is a community. The, the line that, that captures this well is to, is to say that God alone is God, but God is not alone. God alone is God, but God is not alone. And we reflect God best when we are in community, serving others. And that is why when, when Jesus was asked to, to summarize the law, he said, love God, love your neighbor. That's, you are, you are called into the community of God and called into the community of, of others. So perhaps this feeling of loneliness, this frustration that we have in the lockdown, could be, without uh, trivializing the lament, it could be a nudge to say, well, what is this loneliness pushing me to? Maybe there's a bigger purpose. Because you see, we, we manage to avoid these questions. Because deep down, we, we, we are actually lonely, way before the lockdown. But, but we've got all of these hobbies and distractions that keep us away from it. It's a little bit like a very good pediatrician. If you're a good pediatrician, then... You have to distract the toddler with something. So you sing him, singing him a song or you uh, give him a sweet ear, you show him a picture on the wall and then you zap that, that needle in. And, 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 and it's all about being a master of distraction. Those are the good pediatricians. But the fact of the matter is it still hurts. The skin still breaks. The only reason why it wasn't that bad is because you've been distracted. But here's the thing. Is it possible that we've been distracted for so long, distracting ourselves by looking at pictures on walls, you know, sucking on a lollipop, listening to the song, but we are not dealing with our skin being broken. We're not dealing with the, with the problem here. The reason why we are addicted to distraction is because it helps. I wonder if the reason why we are addicted to distraction is because we want to avoid the pain that is below the surface. The pain of not knowing if our lives even matter. The pain of wondering if we will ever measure up. The pain of wondering whether we will ever truly be loved. You see, this is not foreign to the Bible understanding of, of relationships. In the Garden of Eden, again, as soon as mankind sinned, the first thing we do is we feel shame and we want to hide ourselves. We feel guilt and we feel shame. 
And, uh, and that's why God comes looking for them and he asks them, where are you? But, but he's not asking them, where are you, in terms of uh, tr- trying to figure out physically where they are. It's not a geographic question. It's a relational question. I do not feel intimate with you guys anymore. Why are you hiding from me? And, and that's interesting because not only do we hide ourselves from God, this is the human condition, not only do we hide ourselves from God, we inadvertently hide ourselves from others as well. So forget about COVID-19 for a moment. There's been a voluntary isolation in many of our lives for a very long time because deep down we cannot, we cannot stand the thought of being rejected. We cannot stand it. So we're not vulnerable. So we cut other people out and we don't let them in. C.S. Lewis says this, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. That's C.S. Lewis. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to love because the fear of rejection is just too much. So we hide from God. We hide from each other. From each other. So, so what are the things that we use as distractions? It, it might be Netflix. It's definitely also Netflix. It might be YouTube. It might be social media. It might be video games. It might be gym. It might be squash. It might be hiking club. But all our little hobbies and luxuries, as Lewis put it, those are the things that we hide behind because we do not want to deal with with this loneliness that we feel deep down. And again, please do not see this as just merely referring to romantic connection because it's, it's not. Um, there are many Catholic priests experiencing immense joy who are, who are celibate. And as a matter of fact, the picture that we have of heaven is one where we're never going to have the, the kind of uh, romantic relationships that we have on earth, but yet it is th- the best place imaginable. So, so, so we've been sold a lie when we think that you are half a person if you, um, if, if you are not romantically involved or if you do not have a family. People like Mother Teresa, John Stott, Francis of Assisi, all of these people will disagree with you. It is, it is absolute rubbish. Now, again, I want to make a distinction between being alone and being, and being lonely. Being alone is good. It can be good. Being lonely is when it becomes problematic. But again, it is that, that nudge that we need to, to perhaps really seek meaningful and lasting connection. One more thing that I want to unpack is the fact that chances are that you've been listening to this talk and you've been, you've been thinking, yeah, this really resonates with me. I think I sometimes feel lonely. Yes, I sometimes feel like I... I, I do not have meaningful connections or I try to distract myself, etc., etc. But, but perhaps that's part of the problem. Perhaps that's part of the individualism that we suffer from. You are not supposed to listen to this thing just as with the question that I'm asking, yes, I am lonely. A better way of looking at this is to say, yes, we are lonely. As a society, as a community, as a church, or as a family, we are really lonely. Maybe that's a better way of dealing with this. And that's also the... The worldview in which the Bible is is written, or from which it is written, which is, it's not my Father who art in heaven, it is our Father who art in heaven. We are called as a community to think about it. So perhaps when we think of loneliness, the, the better thing is not to ask, how am I as an individual going to get out of my loneliness? A better way of looking at it, perhaps, is to ask, how are we going to get out of our loneliness pandemic? Now, the first suggestion that I want to make is to pay attention. How do we get out of loneliness? We pay attention. Now, Lorraine and I, probably our most frequent and and regular fight, it it goes something like this. Lorraine will be telling me something. I will be reading a sport article, or I will be doing something with a golf club, or kicking a ball around, or just being distracted. And then she will say, just leave it. I don't wanna, I'm not gonna tell you anymore. And then I'd say, Lorraine, I can, I can repeat every word you just, you just said. And then I continue by repeating every word she just said. And then she would say, 
just just leave it you don't understand here's the thing <laughs> apparently listening is not good enough she wants my attention and i i'm pretty sure most couples can relate to this scenario it's not good enough to to just repeat the words and just hear it a robot can do that she wants my attention she wants my gaze and the newest addition to our family it seems to agree with lorraine i I would, would put him somewhere, maybe on his little gym with the thing hanging from the top, things hanging, hanging from the top, and then uh, I would want him to play with it. And then every now and then I would hear a scream and I would just shout from one part of the house, hey, Loki, I'm here, don't worry about it. But you see, my baby is really smart and he doesn't fall for that. He doesn't fall for this uh, mockery of, of entertainment. And then all he wants is for me to look at him. He wants my gaze. He wants my attention. He wants me to pull faces or something. We had tragic things from Romania in uh, just when, when communism fell there uh, in, in the late 1980s. And, and the world started to discover what orphanages looked like in, in Romania behind the Iron Curtain. And what they discovered was horrendous. Um, you, you had many, many of these orphans dying and or just suffering from severe autism or conditions related to that. And what they discovered is that it wasn't through malnutrition. They, they were warm enough. They had enough food. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that those orphans didn't have human contact. They, they didn't have another face looking at their face and, and just reflecting the world, being a mirror to their little world, pulling faces when they are pulling faces, making the sounds when they are making the sounds. They didn't have that. As a matter of fact, this is very sad, but you could walk into a hall full of babies, full of orphans, and you will not hear a word because those babies stopped screaming because nobody ever comes. Nobody ever pays attention. Nobody ever notices. And, and this led to uh, severe uh, you know, neurological damage in, in the long run. And it's not just babies that, that, that wants that. It's adults as well. When I, when I give a talk, now it's maybe a little bit different because I'm not just talking to a, a, a stupid laptop. But remember back, back in the day when we had a venue and when we got together as humans and, and we spoke, then what you guys would typically do is when I speak somewhere along uh, in, in the talk, some of you would fall asleep. And it would kill me when you fall asleep. It is torture. And, and then the only thing that can take me through my, uh, the, the lack of attention that you give me um, would be one or two or three of you that would, would pay attention and I would just focus on your face because it just carries me through it. Because uh, when you give somebody attention, you are basically saying, there's nowhere else I would rather be. I want to really focus. I want to really listen to you. And that is why it's such a such a compliment when somebody gives you their attention it, it breaks that that, that it, it just makes that a, a talk or, or a conversation whatever the case may be it just makes it so much more bearable and, and confession time here guys I, I i i know that that i am probably one of the more distracted people in the world and many of you have tried to have a conversation with me and then unfortunately there might be sport on a television in the background and my mind and eyes and body just drifts in that direction. And I, I would like to use as an excuse uh, that I have been diagnosed with ADHD, but it's a, it's a lame excuse because I've, I, I can get better at this. But I... I I sometimes think that, thank God, I'm not preaching to myself because the way that I sit in an audience and my body language is, is so horrible um, and it, it sends the wrong message. So, so please hold me accountable after this as well, that when I, when I listen, that I would have the right posture and really try and concentrate and, and also have a little bit of grace because my mind uh, goes in, in, in 500 places at, at once. Even when I do this talk, I'm, I'm thinking of things that's not this, this talk. And that's why I sometimes think that you guys are deliberately sleeping just as an act of revenge against me. But I want to tell you to stop it because I've learned my lesson now. Okay, but we can, we can move on. It is horrible when we do not have somebody's attention. 
That's why the psalmist, when he feels that he doesn't have God's attention anymore, he, he says, God, why are you hiding your face from me? Because you see, a relationship, we, we measure in terms of, of gazing, we measure it in spatial terms. Why do you feel far from me? Why do you hide your face from me? And it's horrible when you lose somebody's gaze. Now, I want to move on by saying that we often look at it from this perspective where we say it's horrible when, when we lose somebody's gaze or when I lose somebody's gaze. It's horrible when you don't feel like you matter. When you don't feel that you are getting somebody else's attention when you just try to pitch up and be there. But again, that is playing the victim. Let's take the log out of our own eyes and, 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 and first try and turn this thing and look at it from a different perspective. So in John 9, verse 1 to 11, we read this very famous passage. As he passed by, this is Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work for the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with his saliva. Then he anointed the man's eye with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, it's not him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. No one ever saw like Jesus did. He was always telling us to look at things. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers in the field. Look at that man. He was the best seer ever. That's maybe the first miracle of this passage. Is verse 1. And Jesus saw a man. A man that nobody else sees. Jesus saw him. When Jesus saw him, the disciples' attention were now all of a sudden on this guy. So they saw Jesus seeing him. And now, looking at this, they ask him this question. Whose fault is it that this guy is born blind? What an absurd question to ask. Whose fault is it that this guy is born blind? Um, if he's born blind, how can it be his fault? But apparently there was a... a, a a Jewish school of thought back then that you could sin as a fetus and perhaps you will just you would just be punished for what you did as a fetus and uh, Jesus just says this is not the time to 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 use this guy as just theological reflection it's so interesting that we don't see people we don't see people that do not matter to us and then when we look at them, we only use it as theological reflection. Even in South Africa, when we look at poverty, most of the people who look at poverty, they will only use this as a time for ideological reflection. And then we will stand on the graves of the poor and talk about our capitalism, talk about our communism. And uh, we will have these big fights, uh, people who are not in that position, and we'll have these big lofty the uh, ideological fights. But we are just standing on the graves of, of the poor when we're doing it. We, we're not really seeing them. We're just using it as a as a bit of an intellectual reflection. The disciples did it and we do it. Now, there's something, there's something interesting that happens. Now forgive my, my dark humor, but, but here's what happens. First of all, Jesus picks up mud, he spits, so he, he makes this mud, so it's a bit of clay and, and uh, the, the laws of the Sabbath back then was that you were not allowed to make clay, not allowed to work with your hands, so Jesus is not... Um, he's being naughty, he's not keeping the Sabbath. He puts it on this guy's eyes and he says, go to the pool of Siloam to wash your, your face and then come back. Now, I mean, that, <laughs> it must have been a very absurd scene. Uh, this guy is blind, he's got mud on his face, and he's walking in the streets of Jer Jerusalem looking for the bath of Siloam. It must have been so weird once that guy stopped you and asked for directions. And then you say, you just walk down and you're going to see a big, I mean... You just you just walk down. Just just keep walking. You, you know, you're not going to see anything. Um, but I mean, the story ends well. I, it, it's just I, I've got a problem. But the story ends well because he comes back and he comes back seeing, and it is it is great. 
And the whole debate opens up around this guy. His neighbors ask, isn't this the guy? Isn't this the guy uh, who's been sitting here next door to us forever who's blind? Now, 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 this is what's so ironic and so interesting about this passage is the fact that this guy who, who couldn't see, he is the one who sees, and yet all the people around him, could, they don't see because they, this guy who's been living next to them for, for their entire lives, they do not recognize him. They do not see him. And, uh, and that's the point that, that John, the Gospel of John, is trying to make the whole time. People who can see spiritual blindness, etc. But these people who've been living with him their whole lives were not able to see him. Why? Because he's been invisible to them. And there's no worse feeling than, 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 than invisibility. I, I know that I felt a sense of invisibility when I came to Pretoria for the first time. And, and I mean, I, I came from Porch, it's 200 kilometers. But Porch is a little bit like that Cheers uh, series where everybody knows your name. And I came to Pretoria and I, I just felt a sense of loneliness, disconnection. And then uh, it, it, it's not even thinking about when, when people move to uh, abroad, to Europe, to London, uh, to South Korea, to... Uh, to Cape Town, imagine moving to the Republic of Cape Town, just really struggling to connect with people there. The fact of the matter is, when you immigrate to Cape Town, the fact of the matter is that um, that to feel invisible is horrible. But again, we risk being the victim again in, in, this, in this scenario. Maybe just a closing reflection on this is to say that when we don't see people, on the one hand, we're robbing ourselves of bringing those people into community and experiencing them and, and loving them. But on the other hand, it's also very dangerous. You know, whenever I think of, a, of another shooting in the United States, when, when a gunman you know, gets a gun and just sh kills everybody, and almost always when you read about that person, it, he was a stranger, he felt invisible, but now that he's a killer, at least somebody notices him, even if it's a bad noticing. At least somebody is paying attention, and and it is it is very very tragic. And I often think, what would have happened if we just if people just gave him attention before he, he had this violent outlet for for it. So so invisibility is a horrible thing to experience, and it it can even be a dangerous thing. So we need to really pay attention. But unfortunately, the word pay attention reveals something. When we pay attention, we, we're not just giving attention, we're paying it. And, and like money, because it's, it's an economic term, it always goes to the people with status. Attention goes to people with, with status. So in the, in the same way that you, you pay attention to people whom you d deem to, to have something valuable about them, we do not pay attention, we do not give money, uh, we do not give the money of our gaze to people whom we do not deem to be important. And, uh, and, and that is just totally challenged by Jesus. He, he, he paid attention to people who we thought are not spectacular. And, and in our isolation, here where we are now in our respective houses, looking at this, uh, listening to this talk, and, and, and feeling lonely or lack of connection or whatever it is, we can already start to follow Jesus by paying attention. That is, that is the beauty of prayer, I think. When we really pray, then God calls us out of prayer, uh, out of, not, not out of prayer, out of our own selfishness and our own needs. And if we really ask for him to give us his eyes, we get to see a lot of people. If we really ask for his eyes and his heart, then we see other people as, as he sees them and more often than not, you're going to find yourself wanting to send a WhatsApp or phone, reach out to people uh, who you, you do not necessarily think, because, uh, think of because you are constantly distracting, distracting yourself. So, so I, I really hope that, that we can, after tonight, really contemplate about this and, and try and see people with God's eyes. I know, again, if I, if I take the log out of my own eye appropriately enough, I, I notice that I notice people when, when I'm geared for it. I notice them when I go to the Alur and I really want people to be seen there and, and, and there I'll be on the lookout for, for, for somebody who's new. But, but when I walk away from that setting, 
and I'm maybe somewhere else and I'm not concentrating, then I'm not as attentive anymore. And, and that, is one of, that is probably the second or third or fourth miracle of this passage, is the fact that Jesus didn't go to the synagogue. This, is, this wasn't part of his, his book and big movie, was really focusing on this. He just happened to walk past this guy. And I often think that, yes, we, we do manage to, to be attentive and to focus and to care and to, to look at other people. But do we manage to do that just in passing? Do we manage to do it when other people, uh, when, when, when we are not focusing on it, when we're just going along, when we are just being interrupted? When we do this, friends, we form a community around Jesus. When, when we really try to look with the eyes of God, we, we, we form a community around him and it's a good kind of community. There's a lot of bad community going on at the moment. It's especially in the online world, a lot of bad community in the sense that uh, a good community forms around our love for something. Bad community forms around our contempt for something, our hatred of something. And, and online at the moment, you've got loads of people on the left and the right wing just really hating something. And, and they, they form this little fake community around it and it's horrible. But when we form good community, our world needs it so badly at the moment. When we form good community, uh, it, is, it is something that can really heal this, this, this world. And, uh, and I think we can already start now already to break the shackles of isolation. We can pay attention and we can really try and love because that's what love does. Love remembers, it pays attention, it listens, it notices. When Jesus says, I... I, I can count the hair on your head. That never impressed me. You, know, I, like, you don't need to be God to do that with me. But maybe what he's, he's getting at is this. One of the nicer things that you can do uh, with people, especially females, apparently, is you'll notice when they've changed their hair. You count the hair on their head and you notice, oh, you've had a haircut. And it's apparently brownie points for you, uh, no matter where you are. And, and, and perhaps that's what we need to do. We need to notice. We need to notice when other people ha have their hair cut. And I'm going to make it very easy for you guys, but just always, it's, it's always cut, the, the, the five that's there. And, um, and I'm preaching to myself here, guys. If, if there's one person who's convicted about this, it's, it's, it's me. It might not be you. But, but I am very much convicted about the fact that, that we really need to pay attention, get out of our own selfishness, look at other people, and, um, and, and, and that is going to be a significant step to get us out of our loneliness. I want to I summarize what I've said tonight because I know it, it, it might be a bit all over the place. The first thing is this, that it is a proper reaction for us to lament. We can shake our fists at the heavens and we can lament the fact that we, we, we do not experience meaningful connection with a lot of people that we want in our lives at the moment. Lament is a good reaction. Secondly, I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of this is voluntary isolation. We've been isolating ourselves in this individualistic culture well before the lockdown uh, uh, happened. The third thing is that maybe the nudge of loneliness is a good thing because it can uh, uncover the fact that we've got all of these distractions that we keep ourselves busy with and it's a good realization to go out of it. I, I, I quite like, I love the U2 song that says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Um, because that's a good realization to have. Maybe this nudge of loneliness will, will move you to seek more intimacy with God and with others. And lastly, we need to ask God for his eyes. We should stop playing the victim. We should stop asking, why aren't people serving me? Why, am, why do I feel isolated? And rather, you should ask, how can you serve other people who might be isolated right now? And when you do that, you are called you, 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 you're just putting people into community. You are forming a community. And that is a community that God formed around him. It's, it's the church. So there are two ways in which Christians typically try to make sense of loneliness at the moment. The one is we, we remind ourselves in which we're encouraged by the fact that Jesus felt cosmic loneliness on the cross. And I think it's true and I think it's valuable. He did feel cosmic loneliness on the, on the cross. He, he hung somewhere between earth and heaven, not really anywhere. 
And because Jesus can really identify with our loneliness, that is why we can pray and give it to him. Because he's not an aloof God, he's not a deistic God, just uh, not interested in human affairs. He, he knows loneliness, so we can take this loneliness to him. And I think it's true and I think it's valid. But another way of thinking about it is, is as follows. In Mark's Gospel, there's this wonderful story where Jesus heals the leper. And, and it's this strange thing where Jesus, he was moved, he, was, he felt compassion for the guy and he touched the leper. And, and, and then it, it changed and he was healed from his leprosy. And I, I sometimes think that maybe God, you know, he, he came out of quarantine in heaven to come and touch us. Touch us, us being the untouchables. And he, he left the good climate and the good community that is, that is heaven. And he healed us from our selfishness. And it was almost irresponsible of God to do that. It's, it's very much unreasonable of God to, 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 to do that. But the beauty of it is this. That instead of us infecting him, because that's usually how infections work. If you are going to stand next to a person infected with COVID-19, you're probably going to get it. Or, I mean, if there's contact or droplets or whatever the science says. But the story of Jesus is that although we are all spiritual lepers, Jesus, when he touches us, he doesn't become a leper. We do not infect him. He infects us. That is why it is the immaculate infection. Okay. Our response as spiritual lepers should be this. We come out of our isolation and we see our neighbor. And I don't mean break the laws of the country. I mean, let's, come, let's get out of our isolation and let's pay attention to others. We can do it via technology. We can really reach out to other people now already. And when we eventually come out of this lockdown, let's really embrace the gift of community and notice and pay attention. Pay attention to God. Notice God. Love God. Biggest commandment. Pay attention to our neighbor. Notice our neighbor. Love our neighbor. That is a thought. That is... If we, if we can do that, then maybe this lockdown will be worth it. We can appreciate the gift that is community. And we can, we can follow Jesus in, in this group, in, in this thing that we call church. I want to pray for us and then we can go into Q&A. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, that you are the God who touches us. You do not hide from us. You didn't, even though we were almost irredeemable, you came down to, to contaminate yourself. But in the process, you, you became man so we could become God, which, which is just a, a way of us trying to make sense of how you pull us up to a higher reality, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that we will also pay attention in our love the same way that you pay attention, that we will see other people the way that you see other people. And yes, Lord, we are lonely and we are struggling with that at the moment, but it is my prayer, it is our prayer, that, that we will not just look at this from our perspective, but we would really try and reach out to other lonely people and not just lament our own loneliness in this process, although that is also a valid response. I pray that we will not stay there, that you will move us past that and that we can serve others, that we can follow you by, by seeing the way that you see. We ask for your eyes, Lord. We ask for your heart. Help us to recognize the incredible gift that is community. And, and when this lockdown is eventually done, that, that we will celebrate that, that we will embrace each other, that we will notice each other, that we will pay attention, that we would really love each other. And of course, Lord, when we love you and notice you and pay attention to you, you automatically bring us in connection with others. Thank you for that. And I pray that we can really maintain that well after this lockdown. But I also pray that we can have a bit of that even now during the lockdown. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okie dokie. Friends, uh, if you have any questions, then uh, you can just send that to the, uh, to the YouTube channel. Um, 
Can you please repeat the psalm you used in in the sermon? So that is the first question I already got. Can I repeat the psalm? I can. It's Psalm, it's psalm 88. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I'm going to read the bits that I really enjoyed. So this is Psalm 88. Then verse 2, it says, May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. So please, I, I want to have connection with you. I want you to hear me. And then verse 8, You have taken from me my closest friends, and you have made me repulsive to them. And that's why I smile when I read that, because... Uh, I am now, my, my friends and family find me repulsive, especially when I cough. I am confined and cannot escape. Okay, that sounds relevant. My eyes are dim with grief. That is verse 9. And then verse 14. Why, Lord, do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? And verse 18. You have taken me from friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. So this is Psalm 88. It's a beautiful psalm. It starts out quite positive, but then it goes into this, this dark place. And I think it is, it, is, it is very true and very honest because the, the Bible is a very raw book. It's a very human book. And now is such a great time to reflect on the psalms, or as Chris would say, the psalms. It's a great time to reflect on the psalms. Um, Hanyu says, Jesus becoming human is a model for how we can stop living for ourselves. Philippians 2, verse 4 to 7. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. What passages can help us to get a rich understanding of community? Um, what passages can, can help us to get a rich understanding of community? So, so the one that you quoted there, Philippians 2, uh, is a very good start um, on you to, to see that it's not really about us. It's about the other person. That's the, the first thing. For me, probably the, the most challenging aspect of, of, of really trying to follow uh, God in community is when I realized that the Trinity says that I, I shouldn't try and, and direct any attention to me. I should try and focus it on God the Father in the same way that, that the Son focuses on God the Father and then God the Father focuses on the Son. As a matter of fact, that is expanded on in Philippians as well, if you read between the lines. So they are constantly just taking the attention away from themselves and pouring it onto the other person. And then the, the, the early church fathers spoke about pedicuresis. It's this dance of God because no one wants to hold on to the attention. They're just constantly giving it to others. So for me, that, that is what, what blew my mind. And, and, and I think something that, that's really meaningful for community. But also reading the book of Acts is, is very helpful um, to see how, how the early church operated. Obviously, their context is very different from ours. Uh, we are not martyrs, um, but, but I think you're going to find uh, a bunch of brilliant... Uh, uh, you're going to find a lot there. Also, um, let me think. It's in Galatians. Is it Galatians 3? Where, um, where it says, carry each other's burdens. Let me just... Um, Galatians 6 as a matter of fact bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ that, that is part of our calling to, to bear one another's burdens of Galatians 6 verse 2 not just share our burdens but, but to bear, it with, bear other people's burdens um, and then in, in the gospel of John Jesus says this is part of his long speech at the Lord's Supper and he says Love one another. This is the commandment I give you now. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Man, that is, that is very powerful. And imagine we, can, we will be able to do that in community. Some of the other passages on you that I really enjoy is just when Jesus calls his disciples, they are these, this bunch of weirdos coming from all over the place. I've spoken about this hundreds of times. You had Simon the Zealot. He's a radical right-wing militant guy you have Matthew uh, he's uh, um, he, he's a collaborator he's on the payroll of Rome these guys hated each other they absolutely hated each other it's a little bit like like having Julius Malema and Peter Grunewald on, on the same rugby team and saying guys I want you guys to be roommates 
and bunk together and, and we were going to play this game. So he just takes people from radical different uh, points of view and bring them together. And, and that's, that's, that's the story of, of community. And then later we read of all the Gentiles coming into this strange community. And, and I've said this often, um, but, but one thing that I really, <laughs> uh, one thing that I really enjoy is, is that you, that, that the people that's in the Alur or other people that I really try to walk with um, in, this, in this walk of, of, of Christ, they are part of my spiritual family more so than my people who I just call my friends. And, and the friends that I chose, the friends that I, that I took from, from varsity, dear friends that I have so much in common with, so much more than, than I have with, with many of you. Um, yes, they are my friends. Yes, I've got family. I mean, it's very close. But there's a difference, than the, there's a difference in, in the sense that you've got these guys and then you also have these... Uh, uh, people that you that you do Christian living with, you try to follow Jesus alongside each other, and that's a very deep and meaningful connection. So, Cody Marie says we can learn something from the Joker movie considering loneliness. I could not ha help to wonder what would have happened if just one person recognized him, if he had only one friend paying real attention. Cory, I agree with you completely. That is. Um, that is the point. See, also my 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 old English teacher, uh, Mrs. von Mullendorf, just sent a message of encouragement, and uh, I'm just so nervous when she listens because she can just hear how she failed as an English teacher. So if you guys have any issues with my vocabulary, I'm just going to forward it on to her. And uh, and then Philip says listening should be an act of meditation. We read about three times faster than we speak. So getting distracted is very easy. And we have to constantly bring our attention back to the speaker. I'm going to read that again. I think that's following your advice, Philip. <laughs> Listening should be an act of meditation. We read about three times faster than we speak. So getting distracted is very easy. And we have to constantly bring our attention back to the speaker. Yeah, it's it's hard. It is It is really, really difficult to... Um, to do that uh, and I again I am uh, public villain number one when it when it comes to that and uh, so many thoughts that crosses one's mind and, and it's but it takes discipline and, and that's why love is work Philip I, I think you will agree with that that love is an act of of work in the sense that you have to again pay attention it's something that you give it's 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 focus it's not something that just comes naturally um to 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 be in when it's a real friendship then it doesn't mean that you're just enjoying the flow of the conversation you're just enjoying the bra you're enjoying the fishing or whatever real friendship is when you really invest yourself and you you meditate and you try and listen and uh, try and to try and make sure that you you really understand what, where this person is coming from and one thing in which I've, I've failed miserably in, in my short career as, a, as, as, as somebody in ministry is that I would talk to someone and, and I would ask them, so what's your question? What are you wrestling with? And then they would say something and then I would just like a, uh, like a steamroller respond to that question and I would just uh, tear it to shreds and, and with the, the best, uh, I don't know, philosophical argument and, and theological argument that I can muster, I would, I would try and, and, and just address that question. And then after speaking for 20 minutes, I realized that this is not even this guy's question. I, I didn't listen long enough. I really didn't get to the heart of the question. I just heard something. It triggered a dogmatic button in me and I just went on a, on a tangent. It probably, it's probably happening right now if, if I don't quite understand the, the questions. But uh, Francis Schaeffer, the guy who started Libri, uh, said that if he sat with one of his students with their questions and then he had an hour, then he would take 55 minutes to listen to them and then he would respond in, in five minutes. And I think that is a very good, meaningful, biblical principle. 
Um, do we have any other? No way. So, guys, thank you for for tuning in from me and Loki, and we would just like to say that uh, again. Uh, you guys are most welcome to the Alouag. Uh, Loki actually drew that little poster there at the back. I mean, he's just so creative, so I'm very chuffed with his artistic skills. So, so he would just like to say welcome uh, to the Alouag if you don't feel welcome yet. And then I just want to remind you again of our um, things that's happening. So we've got Bob White that's happening on, on Wednesday. And uh, that's the COVID-19 pandemic. He's going to give an interesting scientific perspective on that. Loki, just read a little bit there on the, on the flyer. Just read. Yeah, COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, we've got the quiz night. All right. We've got the quiz night. And, uh, and then on the quiz night, that's going to happen on Friday. So remember that. And, and then the, the video that we played earlier was just us being um, uh, silly and we invite you to be silly as well that was Andre and Kari and they made a little homemade video of them so so just do something stupid and share it with us and uh, and then if it makes the cut uh, then then we will show it next week uh, Sunday before we start our sermon so this is a tech sorry if I messed it up too much I don't think we've got any other questions coming in maybe um, Maybe a last one. Maybe Gil just asked me to say that you can send the funny videos, just, just send it to info at dialoog.org.za or you can just message Gil, who's done a fantastic job with the, uh, with the technical stuff, to 072-786-3736. I hope you guys have a blessed Sunday. And uh, if you're feeling lonely, I, I, I think you're not alone in feeling lonely. A lot of people are feeling that. And I want to invite all of us to, to lament, to notice other people, and to, to know that our loneliness has been a long time coming, and uh, to try and get the eyes of, of Jesus. And when we come out of this, uh, this lockdown, then I'm looking forward to embracing you guys, if that is legal, and uh, you guys can all, do, all, all hold Loki and even change his nappy. He's very cute and lovable and everything. And... Uh, and, and we can just bry together and have fun. So that's something to look forward to. And I think as a community, um, we, we, should, we should hold on to that. We should hold on to that. Ne Loki. Yeah. All right, everyone. I hope you have a blessed Sunday. And see you guys either next week or with all of these activities that we just mentioned. Bye-bye. Say bye-bye, Loki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. It's got a nice voice. Bye-bye, Ella. Cheers.